Well, good evening. We are going to start with one of my, my, my favorite oldies, Faith is the Victory. It'll be on the screen or it's on number 413. And y'all going to have to help me a little bit because I don't have these verses memorized. And so sometimes for me to play and read the notes and the words at the same time, you're going to have to sing a little bit loud. Now, we've got a lot more folks here, but they're down there in Heron Hall taking care of the family. So we're few in number. Y'all going to have to sing loud for me. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, Elgins of triumphs rod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Our Father God, we thank you so much for being a victorious God, and we thank you, Father, for giving us victory in life. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your care over us. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. All right, I just have a um, few things I want to make sure that everybody gets um, caught up on. Um, I know you, we've been uh, praying a lot for Tracy Ramey, um, but she's had some other setbacks because she fell last weekend. Um, but uh, anyway, she's um, moving into a new home. She's having some good things happening in her life, so I want to continue to pray that she'll just get better. And she's... Uh, anticipating probably having to have some back surgery. Um, obviously, um, probably everybody knows by now that Miss Belinda Cheney, Belinda Burkhead, passed away um, this morning about 1.30. Her funeral will be three o'clock Sunday afternoon at Lawrence Sorensen uh, with visitation at two o'clock. Also, um, You'll notice over on the friends and family side, there's a new name over there, and that is uh, Carolyn Jean Nails, number 40. That's Dennis's mom. She's in the hospital. So we ask that you would just pray for her. And um, I also had another one, but I do not have, the note is in my phone, and I do not have my phone. But it's a friend of um, Rochelle's, who um, had a preemie baby, and the baby is kind of okay, but kind of back and forth. As you know, that's kind of a difficult thing. So she asked us to pray, and I apologize. I didn't write her name down. I put it in my phone, but I don't have that with me. Um, 
But anyway, that's sweet little baby. I believe the baby's first name is Gwen. I just can't remember her last name. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, many of our church members, the ones who are not down here feeding the youth, are down here feeding the Long family. And I know I saw some of y'all were there, um, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what they would do, but they did decide to do a funeral here. Miss Melba felt like she could handle it, and she's there, and I got to talk to her. Um, and uh, what a sweet lady. I don't know her as well as y'all do, because... You know, by the time I came along, they were physically not able to be here very much. And Mr. Aaron would still come and, and count on Mondays, but wasn't able to be here on Sundays very much. So um, I haven't been exposed to them as much as you all have, but I know how much you loved him. And um, if I don't see him before I get out of here, if you see him or talk to him tonight, tell John Norville he did a marvelous job planning that he did a... He was kind of put in charge of that funeral today and put all the music and everything together, and it was very uplifting. And I got to see Dr. Sims today. I was blessed by that. I got me a big old hug out of him, Brother Butch, see, and it made me happy. And uh, Miss Melba, bless her heart, she said, I, don't, I hope you're not offended that I didn't ask you. I said, no. I said, you did us both a favor because I got to see him, and he did a marvelous job, and he adored Mr. Aaron adored that man um, and did a marvelous job. And for those of you who were there, even Mike, um, Melba and Aaron's son-in-law, who we've been praying for, who is now out of the hospital, was able to actually deliver part of the message today and did a marvelous job and had us all laughing. And so it, it was just, it was a blessing today. I, I, I know funerals. It sounds strange to say that a funeral can be a blessing, but Miss Glenda's was one of the most uplifting worship services I had ever attended in my life, and today was was right up there. It was just a it was a God thing. Um, are there any prayer requests or anything that I need to know about? Okay, well let's lift these up in prayer. Will you join me? Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, every day that we are alive is a day of blessings. And Father, we just want to thank you. And right now, Lord, we want to lift up to you this dear, sweet family that's gathered downstairs right now, uh, just enjoying some time to fellowship with one another as they have laid Mr. Aaron to rest. And Father, they did such a marvelous job as a family honoring this, this wonderful man, and I just pray that you would just bless them for that. And Father, as Dr. Sims is driving home, please watch over him and keep him safe as he travels back home. Lord, I know he's tired. Father, we just uh, thank you so much for just, uh, just the way that you, you've covered uh, this family. Lord, we want to lift up to you Mike and Anthony and Amanda and Father and the loss of Miss Belinda. And Lord, we just, we thank you, Father, for taking her home, even though we're never, ever prepared to let go of people. But we know that she belonged to you and we know where she is now. And we thank you for that, Father. And just pray that you would just cover them and give them some, some comfort and some peace right now. Lord, I just want to lift up to you, Miss Jean, and I just pray, Father, for her that you would just heal her body and uh, help her to get to get better. And Father, I want to lift up to you, Tracy, and uh, I just pray you'd cover her and bless her. And Lord, for Janet, I just lift her up to you and ask that you would just watch over her and help her. Father, uh, help her to get better and to get stronger and be able to come back home. And Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I was praying and Janet came to my mind, I realized I didn't tell y'all Janet Watson's in the hospital. If you didn't know, um, her blood sugar uh, spiked at 909, I think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the nurse is over here going, Whoo. And on top of that, her blood pressure was 180-something over. And I just looked at her and I said, Janet, I don't know why you're alive. I don't know how that didn't kill you. I said, you're tougher than I am, but... Anyway, they put her in ICU, and when I saw her this morning, they said they were going to move her to a regular room because she was improving. So um, keep Janet in your, 
in your prayers. Um, it's just uh, it's a lot of stress on her body right there. All right, if you would, just uh, want to point out a couple of things. I've got a few little uh, slides up there for announcements just to make sure you don't forget about teenagers. It's coming up this Friday, and we're going to be out here at the pavilion. And Dennis has built us some cornhole uh, what do you call those? Cornhole boards? Oh, they're so cool. He custom built some stuff. I'm telling you, that's nice. And he's got horseshoes, and we've got a uh, bonfire. We've got firewood, and we're going to uh, roast s'mores and hot dogs and hamburgers. And I mean, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a picnic. And um, as I've said before, don't worry if you, if you think, well, I'm over there, and, and, and I might have to take a restroom break. Dennis is bringing his golf cart, so he'll shuttle you back and forth to the building if you need it. If you want a lawn chair, bring one of those with you. And if you want a, something other than water or tea, bring that with you. That can't be alcohol, right, Brother Butch? No, no alcohol, but you can bring a Coke. <laughs> Somebody told me the Cokes I drink are probably worse for me than the alcohol. I don't know, but I like my Coke. Uh, so I'll probably bring one of those. Um, also, let's see, what else have I got on there, Dennis? I've forgotten already. Uh, yes, Change for Life, if you have not gotten a baby bottle. Um, there are several baskets out there that Miss Mona filled, so grab one of those or two of those if you can. And is there anything else that I am forgetting there, Dennis? Yes, Bemis Heritage Day, that is um, 10 o'clock this Saturday. Yes, ma'am. Yes, he did. Yes. No, let's stop and pray for him right now. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I tried to see him today and I didn't. I missed him. Uh, but, but I did hear that he, everything went well with him. Oh. She may go blind for that surgery, and she's just become a nurse in the last year. She finally got all that worked out and everything. So oh, my goodness. Right now, but, she's been but she, her husband is the pastor at Woodland. Okay. Well, let's just stop and pray for those two right now. Uh, Lord, we do want to lift up to you, Dr. Adams, and we thank you, Father, for a successful surgery, and we pray that this would... Uh, Keep him ticking and going along, Father, for a good long time, and we pray that he would heal well from this. And, Father, we just want to lift up to you this pastor and his wife, Lord. We don't remember their name, but, Father, you know them. And, Father, we ask that you would just cover her and bless her, and if it would be your will, Lord, to bring some healing into her body and protect her eyes, Lord, if that's possible. We just ask that you would do that for her, Lord. And we thank you for all of your love and your care over us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let's grab our Bibles, if you've got one, and join me in Psalm 20. Um, before we actually unpack the psalm, we're going to do some in-depth Bible study. I know y'all love in-depth Bible study. Actually, I think y'all do, uh, because it's fun when you uh, do in-depth Bible study. I mean, you can, you can pull out a verse here and there and read it, and it's inspiring, and it's interesting and encouraging, but when you go and you look at several different verses and you kind of put things together and you're like, oh, okay, that, now I get that. And that's when the Bible gets exciting. I don't understand why people think that the Bible is some boring old historical book. I think it, as a piece of literature, I think it's fascinating and exciting. Um, but when you just see the, the God telling his viewpoint, his perspective of human history and, and, and sharing that with us. And I just find the whole thing fascinating. But I want us to look a little bit at Psalm 20. It is called a plea for help from the sanctuary. And it is a Psalm of David. So King David wrote this. And as we read it later, we're not going to read through it yet, but when we read it later, you'll, you'll see and hear a lot of things that sound like military things, like uh, victory in battle. That's why I chose that song right there. And so I want us to think about this, the fact that David was a military leader and David had the responsibility 
of securing the borders of Israel and fighting off the enemies and protecting the land and bringing peace to the land so that when his son Solomon took the throne, he was able to take the throne in a land where there was peace. But under David's rule, that didn't exist. He had to kind of take that over. Hey, we bragged on you just a minute ago. Yeah, you. Um, I told them that you, you planned that uh, funeral service today and it was very uplifting, very uplifting. And I thought you did a marvelous job. I wanted to brag on you. You, uh, you, you. thank you. I just, all I want to say, just thank you. You blessed me. Um, I had to sit right under him while he sang Beulah Land and not cry. That wasn't very nice. So anyway, we're going to look at uh, this plea for help because as you read through it in a moment, it kind of sounds like he's asking God, help us have military victory, help us have victory over our enemies. Um, I know that none of y'all are old enough to remember World War I, but the Allied commander was a man named General Marshall Falk, and one of the things that he is quoted as saying is that battles are won the day before. What do you think he meant when he said battles are won the day before? Planning. Planning. Okay, so how does that apply to us? We don't fight physical battles. We fight spiritual battles. Can you plan ahead for spiritual battles? How does one do that? (laughs) Prayer is the utmost answer to that. Um, staying in fellowship with the Lord, making sure that you have no unconfessed sin in your life, that you're just all the time ready and in touch with the Lord and, and available, that he can provide those divine appointments. That's, I don't know if y'all enjoyed the story of Abigail as much as I enjoy it, but I think that was a marvelous woman, and God sent her to intervene not just in David's life, but in the life of the whole nation. Do you understand if David had done what he wanted to do, what it might have affected the rest of his, men, his life? And every, I, I, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling to think how God used her to intervene. We're going to kind of touch on that a little bit. David, as you know, wanted to build God a house. Um, I've got this on the screen, 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Um, and if you want to pull up that, you can, but I'm going to pull up several scriptures, so Dennis is a lot faster than us. But if you want to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 17, um, we're going to look at David, and we're going to kind of lay up a little groundwork for how this psalm may have come about. So if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, after David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Remember, they had the tabernacle and it was parked at various places, mostly at Shiloh, but they didn't have a permanent temple yet. And David feels bad about that. And he says, I'm living in a nice palace. It's made out of cedar wood. Now, you and I think of cedar. We think of cedar chests and cedar closets. But back in the ancient times, we're told that the cedars of Lebanon were very mighty, majestic trees. And it was kind of a big deal to have a palace that was lined with cedar, made out of cedar. And so this was a big deal. And so then skip on down to verse 11, if you would. Because he says here, um, this is, this is uh, what God spoke to him. When your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. So David is being spoken to by God through the prophet Nathan. Because originally, Nathan said to him, hey, whatever you want to do, God's with you. Go do it. But then God intervened and spoke to Nathan and said, no, I'm not going to let David build it. You need to go back and tell David he doesn't get to. So Nathan is telling him, God says this, when your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, in other words, when you die, I'll raise up your offspring, which we know to be Solomon, to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. 
He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I'm going to mute this for one second. Excuse me, I got a little tickle in my throat. So God wanted not David to build the house, but David's son. Why would God put such a burden on David, or why would David have such a burden and a desire to build God a house. I mean, that's a great thing. I, I want to build a temple for the Lord. And then why would God not let him do it? Does that sound fair? Huh? Oh, you've read, a, you've read the head. Okay. <laughs> Look at First Chronicles 22. Scoot over to 22 and verses 8 through 10. Now David speaks, and David is now speaking to Solomon, and he's telling Solomon what God said to him. So apparently, either what we read in chapter 17 wasn't everything that God spoke to him through Nathan, or perhaps God spoke directly to David somewhere else, but David is saying, God told me this. Look at verse 8. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. Um, oh, let me finish reading. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So I have to ask the question. God said no to David and said yes to Solomon because David had shed a lot of blood and had fought a lot of wars, but he said, but I'm going to put peace on Israel and Solomon won't have to do that. Um, I'm an analytical person. I have to ask the question, why didn't God just put peace on Israel and not make David have to fight? If God could bring peace to Israel so that Solomon doesn't have to, have you ever... Am I weird that I think about these kinds of things? I'm always asking these questions. I have an answer. We're going to have to dig a little bit deeper to get to it. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, if you go backwards a little bit, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 16 through 18, and we're going to see a little bit more. We're going to learn just a whole little bit more. All right, look at verse 16. However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. I want you to understand, God is explaining to Moses, when you all go into the land, this is how it's going to work. He gave them some laws of warfare. Here's how you're going to do this. And so he's telling them, when you go into these cities that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So now we're going to begin to understand and unpack why David had to fight. This doesn't really explain it yet, but this is one of the things that you need to understand because skeptics, especially atheists, if you encounter any, or agnostics or people who just don't like church, will sometimes tell you, well, the God of the Old Testament is a mean, wrathful, hateful God. He, he committed genocide against the Canaanites. He just went in and told them to kill a bunch of innocent people. You'll hear that if you talk to people and debate them about Christianity. They'll tell you that the God of the Old Testament is mean and hateful, and he just killed and wiped people out for no good reason. But there's something you have to understand. Go back up. To chapter 10 and I'm skipping around here a little bit Dennis 
but you should have Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 13 down in there just a little bit farther. And when you go to verse 10, there we are. Okay, here's what God had told them. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. Okay? He didn't say just go in and kill everybody. He said when you go to a city, make an offer of peace. Make peace with them. He says, if they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Now, you may be still saying, well, wait a minute, that's not really fair either, but at least he's not saying kill them. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, <clears throat> put to the sword all the men in it. So, God said, when you go against a city, offer peace. If they accept it, they'll work for you and they'll serve you. Now, <clears throat> there is another allusion somewhere in the scripture, and forgive me if, I've, if it escapes me at the moment, um, that they could have literally just left. Okay, They could just pack up and move out of Canaan. One of the things you have to understand, and this is why you have to study the whole Bible, you have to study the whole Old Testament if you want to know the story. God had declared the Holy Land a holy land long, long, long before all of this. That's why when we talked about the Garden of Eden, the Jewish people still believe, and, or most of them believe, and always believe, that the Garden of Eden was actually in Israel, that that was the place where God started. I can't tell you if that's the truth or not, but it is kind of logical that that is maybe where God started because that seems to be the center of all human history. Even when you get to the end at Revelation, everything's going to be centered around that one spot. So that is a very special spot to God Almighty. It's kind of like his little corner of the world. He's like, this is my special spot. And I tend to think that that probably was Eden, that that probably was that spot. But whether it was or not, he did declare that that place was going to be a special place. All the way back to Abraham, he was already telling, trying to get Abraham there. Even before Abraham went, God had been trying to get Abraham's family there. God was establishing that as a particular place where someday he would plant a garden nation, a holy people, priests and holy people. And so that was always decreed that that area, that spot, was going to be a holy place. Now, Satan, in the meantime, don't laugh, Brother Butch, you know how Satan is. If he sees God working on something, if he sees God planting a garden, what's he going to do? According to Matthew, he's going to go in there and he's going to sow weeds in the wheat field. So what does Satan do? He goes into the garden. He goes into the holy land. What God has already declared, this is my holy spot. And Satan says, well, I'll just show you what I can do. I'm going to build some strongholds in there. And I'm going to put the nastiest, most disgusting people on the planet that I can find. And I'm going to plant them in there. I'm paraphrasing, okay? I'm, I'm speaking what I think Satan was thinking and based on what we know Satan did that I suspect that what Satan was thinking was, I will so infiltrate this land that it will never serve as a holy place. There'll never be a holy temple of God built on this soil. There will never be a Messiah walking the streets of Jerusalem. There will never be a holy city or a holy mountain of God. It will not happen. You have to understand the bigger picture that is happening. So with that in mind, I want you to go with me to Leviticus chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 18. And I apologize, Dennis, because I know I'm, I'm uh, moving around on you a little bit, not quite in the order I gave them to you. But look, he's already, he's ahead of me. Look at Leviticus chapter 18. I only want you to see verse 3, and then I'm going to show you a little bit about it. Verse 3 says this, you must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. So he's warning them way ahead of time, I'm sending you to my holy land. 
And when you get there, you cannot behave the way they behave. And you say, well, how did they behave? I don't want you to pull it up and read it unless you've got it open in front of you, but I'm just going to go down the list of some of the things that he said, do not do these things because this is what they do, okay? This is a very long list. He says, no one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations, I am the Lord. Don't have sexual relations with your mother, okay? I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he says. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. Do not have sexual relations with your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughters. In other words, don't have sexual relations with your grandchildren. You understand, God is saying, this is what the people of Canaan do. You will not do this. You must clean this out of my land. It cannot remain. And he said, if you let it remain, then they will tempt you to follow their gods and do their sins. He goes on. You cannot have sexual relations with your stepsister, your father's sister, your mother's sister, your father's brother's wife, your daughter-in-law, your brother's wife. These were some disgusting people. It sounds especially like the men. I'm sorry, but it just sounds like the men did not have control over themselves. You cannot have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. You cannot take your wife's sister as a rival wife. He says that you cannot have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife. And then he says this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm embarrassed to read these, but I'm just telling you, this is, this is what God is telling them. Don't you do this stuff. This is what's happening in Canaan. This is the stronghold. These are the strongholds that Satan has built in Canaan. This is what they are going to tear down. So these are not innocent people, okay? And we're going to even explore that a little bit more. He says this, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch. Don't sacrifice your children. You know what's something that's interesting? Because I've mentioned this a, a few times. We've, we've got a lot of hubbub going on in our country over Roe versus Wade and the possibility it might be overturned and you've seen the protesters on both sides. Have you noticed one thing that I, that I saw in the news? This was actually on Fox News, I think. I, not, I, don't, I don't watch broadcast news. I'll go and read the headlines because sometimes it makes my head explode. But anyway, the, uh, the temple of Satan, the uh, the, the national temple of Satan is threatening to sue if Roe v. Wade is overturned because they say that abortion is one of their, their spiritual rituals. That's child sacrifice. They get pregnant so they can sacrifice the child, okay? That's where we are in this country. If that doesn't scare you to death, it ought to, okay? So you say, well, I can't imagine child sacrifice it happens, folks, it happens. That's what was going on here. And then, of course, he says, you know, you cannot commit sodomy and you cannot have sex with animals. Now, you and I are sitting in there thinking, that's not a problem for me, but for the people in Canaan, this was an issue. I just had to help you understand that the Canaanites were not a good, godly people. Now, we already looked at Deuteronomy 20, and we already know that God had offered grace. But what he, the reason he said that they must be subservient to you, do you remember what we talked about? Why did God allow the children of Israel to be slaves in Egypt for, what, 400 years? Why did he allow them to be slaves? If they had integrated into the Egyptian culture, would they have kept their relationship with God or would they have become Egyptians worshiping beetles and bugs and the sun god and the moon god and all that stuff God actually insulated them by letting them be slaves you say well that makes no sense to me God sometimes allows us to 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 be in a position where we are subservient it protects us that literally insulated them it kept them alive 
while they needed to be alive and protected while they could grow. Egypt was kind of like an incubator. They became a great number of people and a great nation, but he kept them out of the Egyptian culture. So you see the same thing happening when he says, if you go into Canaan and you go to a city, offer them peace. If they make peace with you, that's fine, but they will be subservient to you. They will not be integrated into your culture. Why? Because they would try to change your culture. Now, they always had the option of leaving, okay? They could go somewhere else, but they could stay. And if they didn't want peace, God said, then you have to get rid of them and you have to wipe this kind of religion out of here. It's got to go. It has to be clean. It sounds radical. But does it sound any more radical than Jesus saying, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out? What do you think Jesus was saying? Sometimes you have to be very radical if you want to get rid of sin. And why did it matter that Israel be holy? We already said it. Because there was going to be a holy land, a holy nation of people. And what was their job? To show the rest of the world, here's how you get along with God Almighty. There's one God. He's our God. This is how you get along with him. The temple was supposed to be there not only for their worship, but so that other people, so foreigners and strangers would come to know. They were supposed to be a light and a beacon to the rest of the world, and it had to be clean. They had to be clean. He could not allow them to come in and just mingle with these people and their gods and their sin. He wanted to be cleaned out. But look with me, if you would, now. Go to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. We're going to see something here that will help you finally. You're like, oh, we're finally going to understand why David had to fight. Judges chapter 2. Look at 1 through 3. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. He's saying, I brought you here, and I told you I will keep my covenant with you, but you will not make any covenants with these people. You will destroy their religion. You will get it out of this land. He says, Yet you have disobeyed me. He's speaking to the whole nation. And he's saying, you've disobeyed me. You did not do what I asked you to do. You did not clean house. He says, why have you done this? Now, therefore, I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. You say, well, wait a minute. Now you've told us why there's still all this conflict going on, but why would God allow their foreign gods to be snares? Does that seem fair? Does that sound like God is tempting them? God does not tempt us to sin, okay? But I've said this before. Sometimes the worst punishment you can get is what you want. Does that make sense? Sometimes what we want is not what we need, okay? But sometimes the worst punishment, like if you're, you know, um, well, my wife might not like me sharing this, but I remember one time when Paul was a little bitty thing and he wanted to eat too much cake and it was his birthday and he just thought he should eat the whole cake. And his mama kept telling him, Paul, you're going to get a stomach ache if you eat all this cake. And he just pitched a fit and she's like, well, you just eat all you want. Well, he never did that again. <laughs> he never did that again. It didn't like hurt him or anything, but it made him have a tummy ache. And he's like, oh, my tummy hurts. And she said, I tried to tell you, you cannot eat too much cake. You can have a piece, but you can't have three pieces, especially not when you're this little. Sometimes the best punishment is what we want. And God here is basically saying, because you've disobeyed me and you did not clean out the land, you're going to be punished for it. You're going to have to struggle now. And I want you to understand that struggle continued all the way through the age of the judges, which was like 325 years, all the way through Saul and all the way through David. And David was the one who was given the responsibility of finally and for once cleaning up country 
he had to do this. Read with me. Stay there in Judges chapter 2. Look at verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, in other words, later on after all these folks had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Do y'all remember last Wednesday night we talked about generational praise, teaching the next generation? Okay, that didn't happen here. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Do you understand that? God's people who were sent there to be a holy nation for him are now worshiping the false gods that they were supposed to eliminate. Tear down all those altars and get all those people out, but they've allowed them to infiltrate. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed in worship various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. And you see that pattern all throughout the books of Judges. And you see how all the time they were constantly saying, Lord, help us, help us, help us. It was not intended to be that way. It was intended that they would go in, obey God, do what he told them to do, clean out the land, get rid of all the false worship, get rid of all those temples, not allow those people to worship like that. If they wanted to stay there, they would have to stay as subservient people. They could not be equal citizens. They could not infiltrate. They couldn't vote, for example, and vote to worship Moloch, okay? They had to stay submissive to God or they would have to die. And that sounds harsh, but God was trying to get a holy nation established and clean this land out, and they didn't do it. And so all these hundreds of years later, David has to go, and he has to fix all that. Do you begin to now understand David? A little bit more about him. He never invaded another nation. He didn't go fight other people. He didn't pick fights and start fights. He just had to clean up and secure the borders and get all these things out of the land. So then God after he was dead, could say, now the fighting is over and I'm going to not let anybody come back in here and bother y'all. I'm going to bring peace over Israel. And in Solomon's reign, there was peace. And then he said, now I can build my temple. I have to ask you this. Do you think that temple could have been built a lot earlier? I don't know. Is it possible that God had wanted it built earlier, but because of their disobedience, it just couldn't happen? I don't know. Curious. We know that God has a schedule. God has a timeline. And so it's an interesting thing. And of course, God knows the future, so he knows what we're going to do regardless. I know it's kind of mind-blowing to try and think. You know, it's like, what was that movie back in the 80s, Back to the Future? Like, Back to the Future is like, you get your brain twisted when you try to think about going backwards and forwards in time. I, I get that way when I think about all of these things. But I hope that helps you understand a little bit more about David's purpose in life and what David had to go through. Now, finally, we can read Psalm 20. So now you see in Psalm chapter 20, verse, verses 1 through Five, and I titled this, You Can Expect Things from God. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And that's what we just finished reading in that last verse in Judges, that they were in distress. They were very much in distress. And so God, uh, David here is, is writing that God can protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. Ah, from the sanctuary. The sanctuary represented the presence of God. So he's saying God will send you help directly from his holy dwelling. That's an incredible thing. 
and grant you support from Zion. That's where Jerusalem was built. See, it was always intended that that would be God's holy mountain and the place for his holy presence and his holy temple where his holy people would come and worship him. And David understood that and I think he understood what his role was in life. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. 1 Samuel 7, 7 through 9 talks about them bringing sacrifices uh, to the Lord to ask for his forgiveness, to, to cry out to him in their distress when they knew they had sinned. And so David here is saying, may he remember your sacrifices. In other words, it's kind of like, Father, forgive us when we repent. When we come back to you and ask for forgiveness, forgive us, honor that. He says, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing. Can God make all my plans succeed? He can and he will if my plans are in line with his plans. Now, as I've said before, what if my plans are evil or I know what I'm supposed to do, but I do something else, that doesn't mean that God is then has to make that work. I can't just do what I want to do and say, well, Lord, now you have to bless it because I'm one of your children. You know, because God could be like he was with the Israelites. Well, you didn't do what I told you to do. I'm going to punish you for it. But isn't it amazing that even then, David is saying, but even when you do, you can ask for forgiveness and he will forgive you. He wants to. That's beautiful. Do you realize we serve a God who knows I'm going to sin tomorrow? He knows that I'm going to disappoint him some way, form, or fashion tomorrow and then I already have today. And you know what he's waiting for? He's not waiting up there just to see me make one more mistake so he can buzz me. He's just waiting to say, yes, I forgive. I forgive you. That's the God that David understands. And look at verse 5. He says, we will shout for joy when you are victorious and we'll lift up our banners in the name of our God. That's military terms. Our, our banner we carry out into war. And may the Lord grant all your requests. So David is telling us you can expect these things from God, but he also says you must know God's plan for you. Look at verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Now that's a beautiful thing. Do you think that David was anointed by God? Yeah. The scripture tells us that David had the Holy Spirit on him. Now this is before Jesus, so this is before we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, not every Christian had that. Every, not everybody who was righteous, as they would call it, had the Holy Spirit. Saul had the Holy Spirit for a while, but then he got so far away from God, God took it away from him, but he put the Holy Spirit on David. That's why David had these divine appointments. That's why David had, you know, being anointed doesn't just mean that David was a marvelous person. I think he was a great person. I think he had a heart, and God said himself, he's a man after my own heart. But the fact that he was anointed mean that God also did protect him. That's why Abigail was sent in there to intervene. You know, and David, because he was anointed, was smart enough to realize that somebody else at that moment was smarter than him and that he needed to listen. So this anointing doesn't just mean that he's got like superpowers or something, but there is a protection over him. <clears throat> and he is recognizing that. I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot today, so my voice is just about ready to go. <clears throat> and finally, and I will leave you, leave you with this one, he is explaining to us that we have to trust in God and we can't trust in ourselves. So look at verses 7 and 8 and 9. He says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. What does he mean? That's military talk. That would be like us saying, some people trust in jets and cruise missiles and tanks and aircraft carriers, okay? What he's saying is tr chariots and horses, that's army talk for you know our military might. Now, he had a strong military and God blessed him with a lot of victory because remember, 
God gave him the task of cleaning up the country and securing the country. So God gave him a lot of victories. But what is he saying here? That's not where I find my trust. It's not in my military victories. It's not in my military strength. He says, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. What's the difference between trusting in God and trusting in the name of the Lord our God? I don't have a right or wrong answer. I just want you to think about these things sometimes. What's the difference? Is there a difference? It's basically the same thing. I do, I do, however, think about the connection with the temple, Brother Butch, because, you know, we were told that the temple would bear his name, that it was going to be his holy temple, the place that bears his name. Now, in the new covenant, what is the temple? It's not this sanctuary, as much as this is wonderful. What's the temple? You are the temple. So that means you, Brother John, you bear the name of Christ. So when you call yourself a Christian, which you are, you are bearing the name of Christ Jesus, the Savior. That's, does that not send tingles down your spine? You're the temple. This magnificent structure that you've seen images of, that that was the temple and that bore the name so that when people came, that's why Solomon prayed when, the, when foreigners come, Why did they go to the temple? Because they knew that represented God. So strangers lost people in restaurants. I know you do that a lot. Seriously, they should be drawn to you, the temple, because you bear the name of Christ. You see, that's beautiful. That's just like how, how could God love us enough to turn us into worship centers? (laughs) Now, then it becomes a sad thing to think of how many of God's temples choose to not be a temple, but to be something like the Canaanites were. Do you understand why that grieves God? You know, um, I've, I've used this analogy before, and I'll be quick. It would be very distressing if the city of Jackson said, we need to run a new sewer line and the, the easiest route for us would be through your sanctuary. Do you mind if we just plow down the middle here and just put, put an open sewer running through your sanctuary? And we would, yeah, I know you're looking like, what? That's like, almost like reading Leviticus chapter 18. It makes you blush just to think, like, how would you even consider running sewage through God's sanctuary? But when you think about the things we do, the nasty things that we as humans do, in our temple. Do you understand why, why God said that our sexual sin is such a sin against his holy temple? He doesn't want that. Do you begin to understand why in Leviticus 18, Satan was so adamant about the sexual aspect of the sin of Canaanites? Because it was personal. It was a sin against the temple, okay? That's why. It, it, I mean, the child sacrifice is the ultimate because you're taking another temple and killing it, okay? But all of the things that you saw, all of those sexual sins, those are things that just d- degrade the temple. And Satan was trying to create a place where a temple didn't have a chance. It was all to try and destroy what God wanted to do. And David here is explaining to us When he says we trust in the name of the Lord our God, that carries a lot of theology behind it. And he says, they are brought to their knees and fall. In other words, those who don't trust in God, but trust in something else, they're brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O Lord, save the king, answer us when we call. Let us pray about this. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for David. Um, Lord, we recognize he was certainly not a perfect person, um, and yet he was a man after your heart, and you used him to do some mighty things for your people. And Lord, you used him to establish a dynasty through whom Jesus Christ, our Savior, would come. Father, you used him to establish a place uh, where worship would happen, uh, a place that would be set apart for you. 
And Lord God, we also realize from your scripture, you're not finished with that place, that you, you're, gonna, you're gonna do a lot of things in the future, Lord, uh, centered around that place. But Father God, we also realize that place represents something that teaches us about what we are to be. We are to be a temple, Lord God, and what a blessing that is. We don't deserve such an honor, and yet that's what you've bestowed upon us, that honor of being a temple to bear your name. And Lord God, we pray that the lost people around us, Father, that they would not look at us, but that they would see your Holy Spirit living in this temple, that they would recognize that, Father, never for our glory, but so they would simply come to us as a temple seeking you. And Father, that we would be able to share what you've done with us and that you, we would be able to, to tell other people, yes, my God created me to be a temple. He created them to be a temple, Lord, that we can share that with people. Father, we ask that you would, in this nation, raise up a new generation that would value the temple, that we would stop degrading our bodies and degrading ourselves, Father, and we would stop sacrificing ourselves and sacrificing our bodies, that we would realize what a treasure this is because it is a place for your spirit to come and to dwell. We ask that you would do some mighty things in our nation, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.